Hello and welcome to the review of the book that is in the thumbnail that you've probably clicked on. So, The Solarians, this book right here, um, by Norman Spinrad. Today I finished it and this is part review and part kind of me nutting out exactly what I think about it because I'm really not sure. But by the end I was quite annoyed, quite angry, so this will probably be more than a little bit ranty. Whatever. So let's start with Spinrad. I think of Norman Spinrad as kind of a lost and forgotten author, and I might be quite wrong about that. There's people on YouTube that are far, far more experienced classic sci-fi readers than me. Um, Norman Richard Spinrad is an American Apparently he wrote over 300 books. I personally have never met, to the best of my knowledge, a single other person who's ever read one of his books. But I don't have an extensive um, real life acquaintanceship among classic sci-fi re readers. So when many years ago, I think it was probably in the early 90s, I came across the boy the captain's tale from the St Kilda Library, which was having a sale, as they did back in the day. I bought it. I'd never heard of the author. No one else I knew had ever heard about the author. I read it. I adored it. I've held on to this book, and it's not in great condition anymore for many years. I reread it regularly the first few years I have it. Apparently, I haven't reread it recently, though, according to Goodreads. So, well, I don't know anyone in real life who knows Norman Spinrad. He was apparently a very famous American, so American authors are more like uh, writers, readers are more likely to know this author. And sometime last year, I think it was Matt over on Book Piled, Book Piled, Book Piled, something like that. Let's go with Piled. And we all pile up our books after all. He was doing a book haul, I think, and he unpacked this rather gorgeous, quite fascinatingly illustrated little book. It is from nine, it was originally published in 1966, but this version is from 1969. It was in better condition when I bought it, but it's still in pretty good condition. And not too long ago, like a couple of months ago maybe, I happened to be staring through a list of books available just down the coast from me, and I saw this one. And having recently seen uh, Matt's review of it, I got a little bit excited and I went and I bought it and it's Spinrad. Book that I loved by the same author. And it's a small book. It's less than 200 pages and it's by, I remember gulping down the Void Captain's Tale time and time again and I thought, well, this will be a nice little easy palette cleanser in between other projects. It was not easy. This small book took me over a week to read and partly of that was because I often put it down. I didn't, I didn't ever not want to pick it up. I never wanted not to finish it, but I often put it down while I was reading and reading it was slow. So while this book has lovely writing and the scene setting and the backgrounds, the actual writing is rich and gorgeous in a way that I remember the Void Captains being. But there were many things about it that I really didn't like. And at this point, I've got to tell you, there's going to be spoilers all the way through this review, building up slowly to the end, which is Spoiler City. I don't know that you can spoiler something that was first published in 1966, but bear that in mind if you're about to read it. I honestly don't know if you can spoil this book at all. Yeah, anyway, so the book starts with a space battle, and it's a really good space battle. It's a cracking space battle. Humanity is spread to the stars. They're represented by the Human Confederation, and they're battling an alien species, the Duglari Empire. The Duglari are depicted as bi bipeds of a kind of mammalian background, but with a very... Mechan mechanistic, mechanical, computeristic background. They're very logical. They're bent on eradication of humanity for reasons that have to do with their own personal 
way they see the world, they can only, or the galaxy, they can only be one species. It's hard to argue with a star battle and humanity fighting back when their only other option is complete annihilation of the species. We also find out that um, the Duglari Empire are way ahead of humanity in terms of technology, um, number of citizens, battle tactics, battle equipment and everything. So they're fighting kind of, we can't, humanity is fighting kind of a rear guard action and we find out that soul, our, our solar system with Earth on it, has completely blocked itself off from co contact with the Confederation, which are desperately hoping that soul will emerge with some technology or some battle plans that will give um, humanity a chance of fighting back against the Dugs. The fact that the Dulgari are uh, abbreviated to basically what is dogs with one extra zero is a bit math and it's a bit of its time and that's kind of cute and not terribly dislikable. Okay. So we see the battle through the eyes of Fleet Commander Jay Palmer, who is our hero and our intro to the story. He's reporting on how the battle went poorly to his commander when they learn that a spaceship from Sol is approaching, or from Fortress Sol, as they call it. I should also mention that in this confederation, there is a level of computation. The fact that in 66, Spinrad was seeing a world in which humans don't do anything without relying on computers was pretty prescient of him. But anyway, fleet commanders have to obey pretty much what a computer or a computation mechanism tells them about the possibilities and the chances and the percentages. They have to obey it. There's pretty much no way they can go against that without risking court martial and being removed from their position. Apparently, the whole civilization of the Confederation relies on computers, and they've done that as a kind of response to the fact that the Dukes are very computational and everything... Um, that they do relies on the percentages and, and logical computation. So humanity have sort of mimicked that to repel them. Okay, we've got this Solarian ship coming from Earth and it's it's definitely from Earth. It's been validated and these people disembark, um, give spin red is due, they equal numbers of males and females approximately. Um, and while there's some strongly dated cultural themes, in many ways his attempt at writing the Solarian component, it's dated, but not always in bad ways. It, he doesn't come across as particularly misogynistic or particularly racist or anything like that. He's created one of these... One of these societies that would have been advanced and forward thinking for the 60s, let's just, just say. And it hasn't dated as badly as it could. But, despite that, I disliked the Solarians instantly and completely, and I never changed my mind. They are arrogant a-holes, each and every one. They are utterly marinating in their own sense of superiority. What? You want to come? You want? And... If that, those arrogant, self-entitled, up-their-own-buttholes people are what humanity is involved in, evolved into, and that's our alternative, I am Team Alien. Go the Dukes. Really didn't like the Solarians. Now, this arrogance seemed to me very consistent with the often humanocentric view that was often the case in classic sci-fi and especially in American older novels. It's acute, indigestible, and it gets worse throughout the book. I'm pretty sure Spinrad loved these characters, though. I think he saw them as heroic. I think he saw the way they've evolved into this little organic, sub-chosen family sort of thing that works together. I think he actually really admired this creation of his, and since I loathed it, that made the book difficult. So the Solarians descend on Earth, they wipe their shoes over 
anything human there marinade and how wonderful they are for a while they scoop up jay palmer on some weirdly poorly defined mission that human confederacy has been bamboozled into accepting them so the salarians are going off to the duke homeworld for no reason that they actually ever give anyone and with no purpose uh, that is ever provided either to the reader excuse me one second or to humanity in general which is not great um the entire journey they take every opportunity to mock and belittle jay palmer about how much less evolved than them he is about how he's yeah it's just like ugh. these these are your uber alice version of humanity and all they can do is behave like arrogant idiots towards anyone who is less evolved than them because this less evolved person has spent his whole lifetime in the last 250 years trying to keep the human race in space alive while the Solarians were encased in their own little envelope and in impenetrable envelope. It's, it's yucky. And the Solarians are yucky start to finish in every way. So, Palmer, who starts out as a military type person that we, I could sympathize with and understand, becomes more and more childish, less and less impulse control. He in turn raves like a lunatic, explodes in oaths like a child. Um, he behaves like an idiot. So we've got the Solarians that are arrogant. We've got Palmer, who's an idiot. I don't know what Spinrad's trying to do. I, I do know what Spinrad's trying to do. Trying to establish the moral superiority of the Solarians and how they help help Palmer evolve into something better than what he was. Except, yeah, I'm not going with it. I can't. I can't. I can't be doing it. Later in the book, the Solarians actually say that their telepaths selected Palmer as someone they thought was open-minded enough that he might be able to cope with their advanced sensibilities. It's like yuck, yuck. Yuck. And the telepaths. For the first part of the book, after Palmer's been scooped up pretty much against his will and dumped on their spaceship, he's regularly taunted with the fact that they can read his his thoughts and emotions with all the time. And later, of course, we get the, oh, they wouldn't do that unless it was really necessary, except they have been doing it whenever they wanted to, for the up until the paragraph before we get that. So none of that makes any sense. It's not consistent. And it's pretty yucky. So between the uber alis Solarians and the flat childish Palmer, the characterization is really, really poor. And the fact that I know what Spinrad is trying to do doesn't make it any better. It really doesn't. Anyway, so we get to the Duke homeworld. The Solarians pull a few fast ones. They've never explained to Palmer what he's doing there or what they're doing there. Uh, Palmer feels like he's being betrayed. So he screams and shouts a little bit more. Then they all leave the Duke homeworld. And that's, again, pretty good. As soon as we get into space, Spinrad does well. When he's talking about the two different spaceships and the different drives and how it all works, that's fun and I enjoyed it. But unfortunately, there was far more about the Solarians lecturing everyone on how great they are. Um, so from then on, we get a bit of plot. And the plot is good and quite exciting and quite fun to read. The Solarians... Oh yes, spoilers, absolutely spoilers from now on. If you can be bothered, I can't be bothered. The Solarians basically um, were inciting the Dukes to follow them to Sol and wipe them out. And they sort of achieved their goal and then they explained to Palmer that they aren't really b betraying humanity and then they have to do that again and then we get a lot of that. But while we've got plot, the plot is good. And then, off we go to Sol, followed by the 4,000 Dukes. And we're told that there's 7,000 Duke ships in total, and there's more of them than there are of humanity. But 4,000 going off to kill the solar system. 
I really don't think you can spoil any of this. This is so obvious that Parma is being fooled over and over, frequently in unpleasant ways, for no good reason that's ever given. I mean, Spinrad gives reasons, but they're not good reasons and they're not believable. And yet, for all that, nothing happens that is not 100% predictable to me. And me, by myself, I can't even predict the who done it in an Agatha Christie. I don't even try to predict things in books. If I'm reading a mystery, I read along. It's the reading experience that's good. It wasn't Stevenson that said it's hopefully better to travel than to arrive? I like the journey. I like the reading experience. I want the author and the book to show me the reveal. I don't need to think ahead for myself and find out what it is. That isn't proving to my, me that I'm smarter than the author. I'm not. They wrote a book. They published it. I didn't. Um, but in the Solarians, it is so incredibly predictable that I could see every movement ahead of time. And the fact that Palmer couldn't and is screaming and shouting is bothersome. And the fact that the Solarians don't tell him anything is stupid. And the ending really, really annoyed and insulted me extensively. So what we get is the Dugs follow them to the solar system and then they eradicate the solar system, one by one, and finally Earth. And of course, it's really obvious to us, from tiny little Easter eggs scattered around, that the only way to destroy the Duke fleet is if we explode the sun. Da, da, a cabbage could have figured that out by the third chapter. So of course I knew that. Um, anyway, Spinrad has written a really fascinating and exciting destruction of the solar system, planet by planet, moon by moon. The Duke fleet coming in, hiding behind the asteroid belt to get to Earth and explode it. It's all really, really viscerally good. And if I wasn't so annoyed by the characters in it, I could probably have enjoyed it even more than I did, and I did enjoy it. It's like if you want to see the solar system destroyed, Spinrad's your man. And I enjoyed it. What I didn't enjoy was the inherent attitude that humans are the only important thing in the universe, and it doesn't matter if the entire solar system is destroyed as long as the humans get away. The, the superhuman, superman guy, Dirk, whatever his name is, who's the leader of the Solarian, monologues for a while about humans have to destroy soul in order to expand into the universe, in order to be better than they were, in order to evolve, blah, 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 bullshit. What about the rest of inhabitants of Earth? That's what I'm wondering. Had they already killed them all off? Was there only humans left? If so, what is the difference between the human culture that you are espousing and the Dukes, who basically have got structure after structure and no ecology or beauty in their world? If you've destroyed all the ecosystems of the world and there's no habitat left, there's no beauty, you're no different from them. What, so what about the other Earth inhabitants? What about the Greenland sharks, hundreds of years old? The whales? that were alive before the Industrial Revolution even started. The coral reefs, the giant redwoods, the dwarf mangroves. What about creepy cheap's buddies out in the bush? Have we already dis disintegrated all the ecosystems, killed off all the plants and exterminated every single inhabitant of Earth? Or do we just not care? Is it fine to exterminate everything, everywhere except humanity? Because I'm not, I'm not on board with you there. If all of these things don't matter and can be wasted without tears because humans are gone and that's all important, I, well, by now I'm getting serious, serious anthropocentrism vibes. Or possibly even Ayn Rand objectivism. Two philosophies that I completely abhor. Um, anthropocentrism is basically the belief that human beings are the central or the most important entity on the planet. Um, it can be used interchangeably with humanocentrism, and some refer to the concept as human supremacy, which I think is just one small down step down from white supremacy, because basically what you're doing is saying, we are good, everything else isn't worth anything. And whether you is the human, or whether you was the human from one particular heritage, I'm not seeing that as terribly different, really.
and their perspectives I've got no sympathy with. So if you're anthropocentric, anthropocentric, you think that human is already separate from nature and superior to it. I think that ties in with the Christian or the Judeo-Christian motif as well. It's like all other entities and plants on the surface are resources for humans to use at will. And Ayn Rand was sort of on board with that too. So, I basically loathe the Solarians. If they killed off the whole planet out of some misspent notion that it was the only thing to do, I kind of wish they hadn't survived. And the thing is, by doing this, they haven't even won the war. The Dugal still have all their planets. They still have more, more citizens than humanity does. They still have almost half their war fleet and there's no guarantee whatsoever that humans are actually going to survive this battle. This isn't a solution. This isn't the end of the battle. This isn't the end to your enemies. It's just a delaying tactic, which you have got no idea whether it will succeed or not. So really quite well written, very much of its time which was the 60s, and the 60s had issues. Um, really angry at the end. It's like all that plum-mouthed bullcrap that Spinrad spewed at me in the last few pages. That was feculent. So I really resented that. And yet, at the same time, it's really well written. The space parts, the battles were really conceived. He actually made a really interesting race in the Dukes. And it's it's a pretty little book, isn't it? Let's face it. It's quite a beautiful classic sci-fi. And I'm going to hang on to it because I'm still thinking about it. I'll be thinking about it for a long time, I think. Now, an interesting point is that often covers from this era showed strong signs of the artist never having read the book. But this is actually pretty accurate to the way the Dukes are described in it so it feels like someone at least briefed them properly it's a publisher that i don't think i'd ever heard of it is paperback library new york um got no idea it's a division of the Crinet communications i'm not sure i've even heard of them so yes a deeply divisive book and i am divided right down the center about it love the writing love the space writing Really don't like the humanocentric viewpoint. Really problematic. Don't like any of his humans at all. Do quite like his dukes. They at least make sense. And the thing I really resent even more than the des destruction of Earth, which is a plot development theme. Okay, plot developments are fine. It's really making me doubt my early love of the Void Captain. I loved that book. I thought it was deeply insightful, had strong human themes questioning human existence and a whole heap of other things. So was I just young and angsty? Was I too inexperienced to realise that this book was as crap as this book was on the human level? If I reread it, will I despise them as much as I do the Solarians? I, I'm... I'm conflicted and I now want to read read The Void Captain and I also really don't want to read The Void Captain. I want to keep the pleasure of reading it in my mind and unspoiled, so I'm conflicted. Anyway, The Solarians, if you're into classic sci-fi from the 60s, I would say read it. I would really like to know what other people thought of it. I'd really like to know what other people who habitually read classic sci-fi and fiction thought of this. Did they see the same things as me? Is it... I... Yeah. I can't even. I can't even. As much as he's complaining and I'm complaining, you're probably sick of this review, but thank you for watching. Do like, comment and subscribe and all that sort of stuff that the algorithm likes. I've noticed some people just write, Algorithm. That's cute. Do that. And I'm moving on to another book. I need another book that is a palate cleanser. This was meant to be my palate cleanser before Heliconia winter. No, now I real, need a real palate cleanser with real humans in it. Thanks for watching.